This episode is brought to you by Homes for Our Troops, a nonprofit helping build and donate homes to injured post 9-11 veterans. Visit hfotusa.org for more information. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I'm Jack Murphy. This is Military Matters. I'm here today interviewing Dr. David Walton. He's the author of Ruck Up or Shut Up. Not his first time on the show. Uh, actually, the last time we were here to talk about the Special Forces Assessment and Selection course um, and trying to quell some of the rumors around it. Um, so actually, that's a good lead into his new book here, which is a, a comprehensive guide to Special Forces Assessment and Selection based on his experience, not only being a Special Forces officer, but also being uh, a, a PhD, um, uh, having a doctorate that he studied uh, SFAS for. So um, you kind of like are the guy, David, to, to write a book like this. Yeah, th- thanks. Thanks for having me back, Jack. It's good to see you again. And and I, I like to say that uh, I am not the expert on SFAS, but I'm certainly an expert on SFAS. You know, it's a it is a uh, the special forces assess- assessment and selection is clouded in mystery, and that is on purpose. Uh, we we don't necessarily like to talk about it because uh, we're afraid to give away the standards. Um, but there is a shocking amount that's already out there. Uh, and it's just it's all uh, without context and it's sort of confusing. And uh, that that confusion, I think, is bad for the Special Forces Regiment. So as a researcher, I want to research it. But as a Green Beret, I want the regiment to uh, to tell its great story. So that's kind of what I did with this book. Yeah, when when there's confusion about the process, about the pipeline um, that can like turn off people of in the in of itself. Right. Yeah, it really can. And, that, and that's actually the big deal is that. You know, what they're doing at SFAS is really good. I mean, they are really upholding the standard, and that is not an easy thing to do. Anybody who's spent any time at the Special Warfare Center who hosts the the, the selection, you sort of recognize how big that beast is and how many masters that they serve. And they, they they oftentimes get so caught up in the process of running SWIC that they forget to tell the story of how cool it is, how, how SWIC runs and, and what that process is. And that's especially important in, in selection in that because we are deliberately um, shield that that process from the public for, for all the right reasons, right? We don't want to talk about what the standards are because then, then the guys will start gaming the course too much. Um, so what we find is that because our default position is we don't want to talk, we don't want to give away the secrets, they just decide that they'll say nothing at all. And in that nothingness, is the opportunity for those that are willing to speak, which is in, in our case, the guys that didn't get selected are the only ones telling their story, right? So that's the real challenge. 64% of those guys that go to selection don't make it. And they're the ones that go back to their to the operational force, they're the ones that go out and then talk about their experiences. Well, those experiences are all bad because none of them made it. And, and so the, the only story that gets told is their story and that's not necessarily the the full truth. It certainly is a truth, but it's not the full truth. And 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 in that in that storytelling, we end up looking bad, um, bad and defined in any number of ways. But 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 the sort of my takeaway from when I wrote my first article, um, our green brace turning pink about females, was that that. that that we were doing it right. And no one knew about that. And it was sort of like, man, that's really frustrating because we should be really proud of what the boys were doing out of Camp McCall. Camp McCall is weird. It's its own little upside down world. Selection is weird. It's meant to be weird. It is unlike any other training, um, but it is still a great story. It is a good news story for the regiment. I wanted that story to be told. I've also noticed a uh, influx of, you know, social media influencers, offering these like four thousand dollar special ops preparatory courses um so i'm like yeah i I mean i get it i guess but i mean you don't need to pay four thousand dollars to get ready to go to you know the ranger assessment and selection program or the special forces assessment and selection program you know yeah yeah there there is a huge industry surrounding um soft preparation and uh and i get it like like you know, one of the things that plague us is that uh, uh, our young men lack good guidance. 
for whatever reason, call it the 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 plate of the fatherless uh, fatherless home or just the misinformation or whatever it is. But but there is very clearly a need for mentorship and preparation, whatever that is. It could be highly specific, highly specific, um, you know, land nav training. I offer land nav training. Um, it can be um, physical fitness training. It can be uh, test preparation. I mean, just look at the college industry. There is an entire cottage industry around SAT preparation. There's a reason for that, right? Cause it means something. So it, there's a reason why there's this entire cottage industry around soft preparation. And number one, it's incredibly challenging. It is hard to get selected. It is hard to get through buds. It is hard to get through the PJ pipeline. I mean, these are, these are challenging tasks. And what we're finding is that the population that we recruit from is increasingly less prepared for that. So the uh, department of defense just announced uh, within the last few, last few weeks that 77% of eligible Americans are not qualified to serve in the military. They're either too fat, too dumb, or too lawless. Now that, uh, of course, I'm saying that with a little tongue in cheek, but but their 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 health is so poor, they have uh, criminal records, or they're just not smart enough. They can't pass the the uh, the, the 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 test to get in. That. 77% aren't even eligible to come into the service. So so now we're we're down to that 23% and 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 they are, you know, many of them are borderline prepared. So of course guys are going to seek out that opportunity. Hey, I need some help. I got to get fit, I got to get smart, I got to get mentally prepared. There's a huge industry around it and unfortunately a lot of that industry, particularly around special forces assessment selection is really underinformed. You can't expect people that don't know anything about selection to prepare you adequately for selection. They don't know what they're, they don't know what the, what the standards are. So how do you prepare a guy? So it's, that, that, that it's really, really challenging. So, so that's one part of it. There's this industry that preps people for selection. Well, they certainly don't have a whole lot of interest in, in giving away all their, all their, you know, their, their proprietary secrets. Um, and, but the other part about this is, is that, Selection is really, really hard and no one knows the standards and the only guys telling the story are the guys that didn't make it. So now you have this, if it's not deliberate, it certainly is a a, a direct byproduct of not knowing is a bunch of mis- misinformation. You can go on social media right now and, 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 and type in SFAS and you'll get uh, you'll get a hundred different, you get a hundred different replies with 200 different uh, opinions about what the correct answer is. And, and, and probably uh, 198 of them are incorrect. Uh, that, like they're just flat out blatantly wrong. So I, you know, and, and I saw this and I particularly saw it after I wrote the article, guys reaching out to me, cadre candidates, active duty guys, uh, retirees saying, Hey man, that was a great story, but what about this? What about that? What about this other thing? So I thought, and I kept taking these notes saying, well, wow, there really is, I, I need to, I need to get this on paper because there is a very clear uh, difference between what we know uh, to be the truth and what, and what the truth is, well, is getting out there in, in the general public. So on, on that note, Dave, um, could you briefly sketch out your background just as a, as a, as a soldier, but a, as an author, also an author of this book, I mean, why should people listen to you? Yeah. Why, why do I get to be the, the spokesman for the Green Beret? So I, I'm a uh, retired Army Special Forces officer. I joined the Army in 1991, uh, commissioned uh, as a cavalry officer. And then in 1997, I, I took the journey to, uh, to Special Forces Assessment Selection, successfully made it, uh, served in the 7th Special Forces Group, um, went on to serve at uh, JSOC and then retired out of the Special Warfare Center uh, uh, at Fort Bragg, where part of my leadership portfolio was oversight of um, SFAS. Um, and then I, uh, I retired in 2013, uh, uh, went into academia, uh, went on to get my doctorate and wrote my dissertation about selection uh, and then stayed in the Special Warfare Center uh, in academia and continued to study SFAS for you know 10 years up, up till now. So I have been studying selection as an academic for well over a decade. I led the efforts to revitalize uh, selection during my time on active duty. 
Uh, and then, of course, I'm a selection graduate. So I have a long and rich history of selection, and I have it from both a scholar and a practitioner's point of view. And and I'm, so I have a, a unique perspective in that regards. Like I said, there's there are probably not um, – I'm not a, the expert in SFAS, but I am an expert. There may be a dozen people in the world that can speak to you intelligently about all the components of SFAS and why it happens, and I'm, I'm probably one of those guys. So in so that's a unique position in that when people speak about SFAS and they they speak from it from a singular perspective or just a narrative, that's really frustrating because you you like I I I know the answer and they're not giving the correct answer and they're doing a huge disservice to the cadre that are out there executing this beast. And uh, so that's why I decided to write this book. It, uh, so about four years ago, I started studying the female uh, integration into selection, wrote an article last fall. Uh, you and I spoke about it on your, on your podcast. Great feedback from that podcast. People really uh, enjoy listening to that. Um, and in that feedback, I got a ton of feedback from, like I said, active duty guys, uh, candidates, successful candidates, um, retirees, cadre. And they they all said, hey, it was a great article, but I'd like to hear more about this, your thoughts on that that subject or, or whatever. And I, as I was taking these notes, I thought, oh, boy, this is a um, this is sort of the makings of a good book here. Like there's a lot of good information here and I can I can tell this story without violating my non-disclosure agreement and without giving away all the secrets that Swick wants to protect. And uh, so I started putting pen to paper, um, started circulating those notes to uh, to to friends and colleagues and guys in the brotherhood. And they said, hey, this is really good. And uh, th- and from that was born this book, Rock Up or Shut Up. And uh, and it's I have to say, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. It tells the story of um, selection. It tells the, a little bit of the culture of Green Berets. Uh, and then it talks a little bit about sort of the legend, the lore and the, the hype sur- around selection. And it does it in an entertaining and informative way. And my goal is, is that people will read this book, understand the truth, understand how it's based in, in evidence, not just my opinion. It's like, there's a ton of information out there. Uh, and, and I've synthesized it all in one place and they'll, they'll read this and then they won't have to listen to the kid that went to selection and failed and is, and is telling his story as though, you know, he got screwed by the system and, and they did these, they, you know, they did him dirty because obviously they did him dirty if he didn't get selected. And I want him to say, "Hey, I, I, here's a chance for, for for me to go to selection and and be part of the brotherhood." And 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 now I know if I go, I'll be given a fair shot. And here's what I need to do to prepare. Or or they don't have to listen to you know some uh, guy like me that's a little bit over the hill. I mean, I went <laughs> back in uh, 2005. I mean that we're talking coming up on like 20 years ago. Um, yeah. So I mean, you know, the information that someone like I I have may not be totally up to date. But but that's that's not without its value though. I mean, part of the part of the the greatness of selection is that it does have this rich history of guys like you who went in two thousand five. I went in ninety seven. I mean, that was forever ago. I mean, I wore BDUs when we went through for crying out loud. So so there is richness in that, and and and, and there is a history to selection, and it's important that we acknowledge that because we what the course is today is a derived from its history now. Mm-hmm. That history is not always 100 percent accurate, um, but but there is history. And the cool thing about selection is, is that it's been going on for, you know, 34 years that we have all of the data. We like they keep really good notes about what selection is and has been and what the standards have been. So I had access to all that data and I was like wow, like we really are doing the things right. Like the standards have not changed at all. They're, they're a little different, but they, they they haven't gotten easier. And, and and I wanted to tell that story because that's that's a very different story than you hear from the candidate who went and failed. His his story is, is that I didn't get selected because they didn't like my tattoos. And it's like, mm, I don't know about that, brother. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about well, what's in this book. I mean, you're, you're you know, uh, in the boots of a uh, young soldier thinking about going to special forces assessment and selection, they pick up rock up or shut up. Uh, what are they going to find in this book? Yeah. So I start off with a little bit of the the untold culture of, of special forces. And, and, you know, there's a ton of great books that will tell you all about special forces. There's a ton of, if you have access to the internet, you carry in your pocket a device with unlimited access to 
all of the information that we've ever ever collected ever and th- there sits in your in your phone that the, in your in your pocket that smartphone so if you want to find out about the you know what what are the what are the special forces groups names and where are their areas of responsibility and what the different MOSs do you, you'll find that on your phone you won't find that in this book but what you are less likely to find on your phone is a is a a coherent discussion of the culture of green berets so i start out with a discussion of the culture of green berets like literally we have a discussion about the green beret and why it's important and what that means and it's told through the lens of a of a of what it, what it meant when i went to selection so i i do recall you know, some of my history, because I think that's important and how that plays in today. And we talk about unconventional warfare and big, big boy rules. And these are the things that dominate the the culture of the Green Beret now. So, Dave, the the, the Green Beret and I'm, I'm trying to dig into my own memory banks right now. Uh, is that um, and again, I may be no, no, I'm mixing I'm mixing my uh, beret stories. Because the one, it's the 82nd uh, Maroon Beret that came from uh, the Brits. Uh, where, where did the where did the rifle green beret come from? Oh boy, now forces? now we're going deep. We're going back to the yeah original. yeah yeah. I want uh, it's a little history quiz, we're, but we're I, I know you're up to it. Group. Yeah, so there was a a, a a a wayward group of soldiers that were assigned to tenth group. So tenth group in special forces is known as the originals, and I'm a seventh group guy, so that pains me to say that. But 10th group is the originals. And and uh, when they first started out, this is where this is where where uh, the OSS transitioned uh, and the first special service force transitioned into into Army Special Forces. And before we were special forces or called Green Berets, um, a bunch of wayward soldiers um, uh, started wearing this beret. It, it played back to their experiences in World War Two. And, and it became this, the unofficial headgear and guys would just kind of wear it around and and, uh, and and it just was sort of, you know, it would, it would irk all of the uh, conventional commanders and many, many special forces commanders. But, you know, the boys, the boys are going to do what the boys are going to do. And, and and they wanted it. And then back and this is, you know, this is in the, in the early 50s or late 50s, early 60s. And then in 62, um, when when President Kennedy visited Fort Bragg, uh, General Yarborough was the commander of the of the the Psy War Center back then. Um, he had the beret on, and it was a, it was a very deliberate play. There was a lot of politics at the at that point about about headgear and berets and 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 uh, and who was going to get what. And Yarborough, um, defying uh, what the leadership wanted, wore his beret when when President Kennedy came and visited. And Kennedy remarked on that, like, well, that's a, you know, hey, that's that's pretty cool looking. And it, there was a, you know, some discussion about it. And then Kennedy, re- President Kennedy returned to the White House and penned his now famous memo where he where he described the Green Beret in, in detail in the memo, sort of thank, thanking General Yarborough and the boys for hosting him. And where he said that the, the Green Beret is, is a mark of distinction uh, a, a symbol of excellence, a badge of courage, and a mark of distinction in a fight for freedom. And he awarded that beret to the regiment. So it became ours then and um, and was forever a stick in the eye of those that didn't want us to have one. It's so better, better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. Absolutely. Yeah. A, cl- a classic <laughs> example of that. And, and it became ours. And uh, and it was the that was the sole representation of of special forces for a long time. We had that long. We had the beret long before we had the tab uh, and be long before we were a recognized branch. Um, so it, it has always sort of represented a bit of a rebellious streak uh, in that Green Berets will, uh, will sort of do things effectively, not necessarily um, within all the established customs and courtesies that one one might expect. <laughs> but so so it's ours now. And what's interesting about the, the Green Beret is that, you know, back in the day, um, it, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't common to wear it back when I, when I was on an ODA, you, you would wear your beret once or twice a year. I mean, you just never wore it. And then in, in 2001, uh, general Shinseki, uh, had the, 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 the incredibly bad idea to, um, give the award, the beret to the entire army, the black beret stole it from the Ranger regiment and, and gave it to the whole army because, 
uh, elite units wear berets. So if a, in a unit wears a beret, it must be elite. And, and of course, you, you were around that at that time, and that was a a incredibly bad idea and incredibly poorly executed. But the message I think was very very clear in that that if you don't if you don't uh, make the beret. Uh, an integral part of your organizational culture um, that you, you run the risk of losing it. The Rangers lost their beret. I mean, they were, and there was a significant fight. Uh, a lot of, a lot of folks went to the, went to the mats on that and it just, it didn't work. And I, I think that was the, about that time senior leaders recognized, Hey, you know, we, we, we don't really wear the beret a ton. It's, it means a bunch to us. It is a big deal, uh, but we don't wear it a ton. And we're going to start wearing it more and more often. And now it is the default headgear for garrison wear, even though it, I don't th- And I, so the problem with that is I think that it, it now represents um, a little more uh, of a, um, you know, a garrison headgear as opposed to what it meant when I went through selection, which was like unending sacrifice, selfless service and, and hard routine in the field. Uh, and you wore the beret once or twice a year to change the command ceremony. And now it's like you wear it every day and that's, it's just kind of a headgear. And I think it's lost some of its, uh, some of its meaning in that, in that, in that time. Yeah. And to, to be clear, I mean, the beret, it, it is a, uh, a great piece of headgear looks great in the class a uniform, but uh, to wear it day to day is a little obnoxious. It, it's horrible. <laughs> It's horrible. It's hot. It doesn't shield your, your the the sun from your uh, in your eyes. I mean, it's you got it takes both hands to put it on. And everyone's seen the guy that doesn't doesn't do it right, doesn't wear the break correctly. It looks like a damn chef walking around out there, like it looks like a mushroom cap. And and the Rangers, oddly enough, the, you know this, the Ranger Regiment. It was a rite of passage to to get to wear your beret. A newly assigned Ranger private to the Ranger Regiment had his team leader on him like white on rice. And and you had to prepare that beret and shave it down and shape it. And you had to really, really earn it. So it meant something. And so I have never seen a ranger even to this day with a bad beret on his head because it means something important to them and and, and i routinely i know I, I i live and work at fort bragg north carolina the center of the universe and the home of special operations um and you still to this day walk around this installation and see guys with horrible looking berets and i think to myself man you've do, you're doing yourself and your regiment a huge disservice so so yeah it, it, it's not a great piece of headgear it looks awesome but it, it it's not real good. I'd much rather wear a patrol cap. It, are, are by the way, are you still allowed to call it Fort Bragg, Dave? You can pry Fort Bragg from my <laughs> cold dead fingers. <laughs> I will never stop calling it Bragg, and I encourage everyone. Listen, it's it's not about that th- that it's called Bragg. It's that that you had the opportunity to rename it anything you wanted, and they chose yeah. Fort Liberty. Yeah. Uh, like are we in a video game? What is this? Could have called it Benavidez. Could have called it. Could have called it Donlin. Could have called it a hundred different. There are there are thousands of honorable men that has served and made Fort Bragg their home that they could have called it and they didn't. So just out of spite, I will never call it Fort Liberty. Yeah, no, I I agree, man. There's so many uh, Medal of Honor recipients that they could have named the base after and yeah. to go with something so kind of bland. A real missed opportunity. Re- yeah, really a shame. Um, so getting in uh, into your book a bit more, uh, tell us about you know what else beyond the 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 history, the the initial chapters about the history and the culture of special forces. Getting into the the as you call it the upside down world of Camp McCall, um, what is the sort of like um, practical preparatory information that readers will pull out of this book? Yeah, so I, I wanted to approach it in, and I had to be very deliberate, right? Because I, I have signed a non disclosure agreement. Uh, I don't want to give away all the secrets. I don't want to violate the trust of the brother that's given me. Um, but there is a ton of information that is already published. So. As a researcher, I, I want to look towards those quality sources that will give me that information. And there are a, a ton out there. <clears throat> when I last counted, there were over 50 peer-reviewed academic articles about SFAS. So 50 people have gone, at least 50 people have gone before me and have written about selection. And it's and the and SWIC has endorsed those studies. And and, and so in that is a a ton of information that can tell us about what what is what is selection and what does it look for and how does it work and, and all that. So what I did was 
So you can you can access those are available on the internet. You can go out and look for them if you if you do enough search, and it's not that hard. A little, little Google foo, and, and you'll have them. But they're all sort of bits and pieces, and they they don't they don't they're not woven together into a into a they're individual threads without a fabric. So I said I'm going to make these into a fabric. I want to put them in order. I want to put them. I want to uh, rate them for value. Pull the information of each one that 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 can tell the story accurately and and not give up the standards. The, the, the assumption is if Swick has endorsed them, then they, they, they must be cleared to be released. So all I did was sort of put those together. But if you just sort of cut and paste those, the stories they tell together, you don't get a very good story. You get a bunch of, you know, clunky little tidbits, little bullet points. So I, I told that I, what I did was I, I wove all of those, um, of those sources together into a narrative. So the first part of the book is about the culture, the legend, the lore, the second part of the book is just just descriptive. Here is what SFAS is. Here's the three weeks. It's it is Gate Week. It is Nalan Nav Week. It is Team Week. Here's what it looks like. Here's the things they test for. I'm, I'm not telling you the standards. I'm just telling you here's what they test for. So all of that information is readily available. You put it all together, and it tells a pretty interesting story. But you, you, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make much sense. Like, great, okay, I know what they're going to do, but you know, how do I prep for that? So then the next part of the book is. This is how you prep for that. So, you know, the, the, the physical fitness assessment is the first thing you do, and it consists of these, these events, and here is how you prep for that. The next thing is the, the psyche valves and the, and the cognitive tests and the, 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 the defense language aptitude battery, and here is how you prep for that. And then you know, the next thing you do is the rock runs, and here's how you prep for that. So the, the, there is a ton of information in the book about rock preparation. You can't call your book Rock Up or Shut Up and not talk about a bunch about rocking. And that's important because what the literature shows us is that rocking performance is the number one predictor of success at selection. If you think back to your time at selection, every important decision that you made, you made with a rucksack on your back. I mean, it it just it melds to your body. It becomes one with you. It becomes like a parasite that's permanently fused to your traps and 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 back. And uh, and so you you better learn to love it, and you better learn how to be a good rucker. Uh, the data shows us that, and we know that from our experiences. So I spend a good deal of time talking about what that entails. And as you know, that's no small thing. Like, like learning to ha- learning to be good one with your rock is is a is a a a is a transformational uh, challenge. J- just the just little things like like how to adjust your straps right, and how to pack a rock. You know, where do you put the heaviest stuff, and how do I prep my feet? People these days have soft feet. Too many dudes, too many guys wear "Hey, dudes" shoes, and uh, they need to start wearing some combat boots because the, the foot issues are a huge deal at selection. Forty-four percent of candidates will see a medic for bruises or blisters and abrasions on their feet. And, and, and we know that because there have been studies on that. They've been published. So I pulled that information. So think about that. Half of all candidates are going to go see a medic about about torn up feet. Uh, and that's just the ones that go see the medics, you know, and nobody escapes selection without torn up feet. So you better start spend some, if you want to go to selection, you better spend some time getting your feet ready. I spend page after page telling you, this is how you get your feet ready. I'm an experienced guy. Here's the literature. Here's how to get your feet hard. So you, so you, you're not one of those guys that, that fail selection. Cause he couldn't, couldn't walk anymore. Yeah, like down, down to telling dudes the right way to tie their boots. A hundred percent. Like, and it sounds silly. Like, Hey, I'm a grown, I'm a grown ass man. You don't need to tell me how to tie my boots. Like, Oh, well, there's a little bit of art to that science. And, and just, and a, just a little thing like learning how to relieve the pressure off your forefoot with a lacing technique could be the difference between finishing selection and being an, being overwhelmed by pain. So, so I try to cover everything, boots, socks, insoles, foot care, how to lace your boots, all, all of that goes into it. And then, and then a, a methodical process step by step to go from baby feet to hard feet. And, uh, and I lay that all out in the book. So I try to take that same really detailed approach to something simple as foot care into everything, into how to set up a rocking program, how to, how to, how to run a PT program. And the challenge is, is that once you get into that fitness world, that, that you know, rocking prep and, and PT prep and team week prep is that, as we discussed earlier, the industry is so full of guys that are really heavily marketed um, that look, look great. They have all the credentials, but they, they don't know anything about selection. And uh, so what you get is these, 
these sort of generic programs that have cool flaming skulls logos and, but they don't actually get a guy prepped. And, uh, and, and again, there is ample literature that tells us how to prepare for selection and particularly rucking and, uh, and, and every program that I did, I, I, in, in the process of this, of this, uh, writing the book, I, I took about 25 existing prep programs from all of the big names. I, I su- subscribed to their services under pseudonyms. I got copies of everything and I compared them all and I could not find a single one that followed the correct procedures. And the reason is, is because they don't know the guys that run those programs don't have a good understanding of what it takes at selection. Even a guy who's been to selection, his only experience with selection is that he's been to selection like that. I'm not sure that necessarily makes you an expert. So you really got to dig into the literature and there's a ton of it available. And then you come up with something uh, coherent and cohesive and effective. And that's what I think that the book has done. And the response from the, uh, you know, from the, from the community has been huge. Guys love the book. They, they love the war stories. They, the, 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 those seem to resonate the, the most with guys, um, but it is full of really practical advice. Like you could pick this thing up, this book, not knowing nothing about the army, uh, at, at all, or much less uh, Green Beret or, or rucking or the culture. And then after reading this book, you'd have a really good, uh, a really good place to start, to start your journey to becoming a Green Beret. And that was my goal. Homes for Our Troops, HFOT, is a publicly funded nonprofit organization that builds and donates specially adapted custom homes nationwide for severely injured post 9-11 veterans to enable them to rebuild their lives. These homes restore some of the freedom and independence our veterans sacrifice while defending our country. Nearly 90 cents out of every dollar spent has gone directly to supporting our veterans and enabling them to rebuild their lives. Visit hfotusa.org, that's hfotusa.org to learn more. Yeah, I mean, now that you got me thinking about it, I mean, there's like very few things we did at Selection where you weren't wearing a rucksack. I mean, I think like a few runs, the nasty Nick, and then like maybe log PT or rifle PT, but yeah, I mean, every which, other which they don't do single, anymore, right? Every single other thing we did, we had a rucksack yeah. on. In, in, in particularly, Jack is land nav. Land nav is yeah. becoming the sort of the elephant in the room, and we're seeing those numbers. The land nav failures at selection are going up. Just a a year ago, maybe 25% of a class wouldn't pass land nav. Six months ago, maybe 35% of the class. Uh, In the last few classes, upwards of 50% of the class is failing land nav. And it's what's interesting is that I've I've spoken to a ton of guys that are down at Fort Benning. So let's let's think about land nav. Let's just think of it logically. We don't have to think like Green Berets. We just have to think how how would a smart person approach this. So take your average uh, 18 X-ray. So a a pipeline kid who goes to 11 Bravo, 11 X-ray OSA down at Fort Benning. And he may only do land nav at Fort Benning three or maybe four times total. And only one of those will be alone. The rest of them will be as a group. And he may not do night land nav. So then he, so then that kid graduates, he comes up, he graduates to OSA, comes up to Fort Bragg, and he goes through the 18 X-ray pipeline, that special forces prep course. And again, he may only do land nav three or four times and never solo night land nav. So now a kid shows up to selection and he's ostensibly been through the prep course. He's been through infantry training and he has only done land nav between six and eight times ever. And he may have never done it by himself at night. So how well do you think he's going to do at selection when he's never done this thing before? And, and so you know, logically, you can't blame the maneuver center down at Benning because their intent is, hey, we need to get a guy minimally prepared and we're going to send him to the operational force. He's going to show up to the 101st, his first unit, and he's going to have a team leader and a, and a squad leader and a platoon sergeant, and they're going to train him how to do land nav. Maybe. Uh, I, I don't know that that happens the way that we think it does, certainly not the way it used to. Uh, but for our 18 X ray guys, they don't have a unit. Their unit is the prep course and they only do it three or maybe four times. And so what we're seeing is 
the the we have not changed the standard of land nav at selection. It has not changed in 34 years. And but the the failure rates are going up because guys aren't as prepared when they show up. And it's like, okay, so what are we gonna do? Are we just gonna are we just gonna write everybody off? And interestingly, officers do better. So there's the old trope. If you're, you know, the LT gets lost. Hey, the officers are horrible with land navigation. They always get lost. But every single commissioning source has a significant land nav component. So West Point, ROTC, OCS, there's a bunch of land nav training and testing that goes on with that. So by default, officers get a bunch more prep in the form of their commissioning source. So and you won't be surprised to learn that officers at selection do much, much better than their enlisted counterparts, particularly in land nav, because they've had a bunch more prep. So uh, so we've identified that. Hey, here is an issue. So what we, what we now tell candidates, what we should be telling candidates is you need to do a bunch of land nav prep because it is it is it is failing more guys at selection than it should and uh or than it used to and the reason is just because guys aren't as prepared so let's start prepping guys so i i'm not advocating that we should lower the standards at all i think the standards are are very fair and we shouldn't touch them um but guys need to recognize that if you want to go to selection and you want to do well you better learn land nav because it's it, that's what gets almost half of the class fails land nav and to your point about rucking Land nav at selection is one of the only places that you do land nav with a ruck on and that having that ruck on, it, you know, it introduces a unique cognitive load, a physical load for certain, but it also overwhelms you. Anybody who's spent any time with a ruck on their back knows that when those shoulder straps start squeezing real tight on your traps and on your back, man, that just starts to overwhelm you. And what most guys do when they train rucking is, they put in their earbuds and they, they listen to their music and they specifically turn off their brain and they just go rucking and they're just rucking purely as a fitness event for time. But at selection, you don't have that luxury land nav. you got to be thinking the whole time. What are my routes? You know, what's my time? Do I have all my equipment? Am I managing myself correctly? Am I, am I making good decisions? So you can't turn off your brain. Every important decision that you make at selection, you make with a ruck on your back. Then you go into team week and team week is a, is a master's class in, in cognitive overload. And you're wearing a ruck the entire time and not just a ruck, but we're throwing in a, a several hundred pound apparatus on your back on top of it. So the, the, the ruck runs at, at, at SFAS are certainly a huge component of it, uh, of the, of the failure rates, but the ruck never comes off your back. Like I said, the nasty Nick is about the only time you're not wearing it. And the nasty Nick is its own little devil with the heights and the enclosed spaces. So, so you better learn to be a, a rucking expert or certainly be comfortable being incredibly uncomfortable with a ruck on your back. So for, uh, you know, the land nav portion, there's some some practical advice in the book about uh, land navigation, map reading, route planning, uh, some stuff I wish I had been better skilled at <laughs> you know, during, yeah. during my time. Uh, and then when you get to team week, I, I mean, team week is kind of like its own thing, too. I mean, there, I think as you, you point out in the book, like there's really no nece no way to prepare for that necessarily. It, it is the unknown and the unknowable. And there is no way to prep. So everyone wants to wants to talk about specificity. So if you want to train for the PT test, you can do push ups, sit ups, pull ups, two mile run. Pretty easy to do. If you want to train land nav, you get out there and train land nav. It's, it's a fairly simple, uh, the skill itself is fairly simple. There's some, there's some, you have to get some repetitions and some conf some confidence and, and some, some more training, but team week is like, how do you prepare for team week? So anyone who's been to selection, uh, even those that have, that have been unsuccessful will generally concede the point that team week is selection. You sort of, you have to go through gate week and, and go through land nav week to earn the right to get, to get beat up in, in team week. And, and so you, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. So you get the team week and what is team week? Well, it's four days long and it is a series of events where you have to carry heavy loads across very terrain for time. What does that look like? Sometimes it's a wheeled apparatus, Sometimes it's a disabled Jeep. Sometimes it's just a couple of ammo cans or some sandbags. And, and, and when you look at it as a, you know, in each singular event, 
it's it's really doesn't look like much. It's just a sort of wacky little event. But when you do it like up to four events a day for four days, it's like how do you how do you train for that? Like you you don't. There's no way to train specifically for carrying the Sandman. So the Sandman is the one event that I chose to highlight, and the, the Sandman is in my mind the the quintessential event at selection in that it is it is deceptively complex it on its face it looks super super easy you just got to make this h frame apparatus and carry a heavy sandbag weighs about i don't know about eight eight hundred pounds total six to eight hundred pounds depending on which sandbag you get and and god help you if it's raining because now it's wet uh and then you have to push a jeep and your team gets a couple apparatuses and a couple jeep and you got to move this thing you know, a, a specified distance. And when you look at it, like, you're like, Oh, that's pretty easy. And you can go on Swix social media and there are literally 50 photo photo essays of this thing. You can just see exactly what it looks like and they show it to you, but you look at that and you, and so you're like, well, that looks, yeah, probably looks kind of hard, but to see it in person in context is it is the upside down world. And you will see this simple event and carry this little thing, you know, what, what, however many kilometers and you will see this thing utterly destroy the psyche of hardened combat veterans from, from the, the most storied units in the army. And, and because it just, it is so unique, that cognitive load, that physical load, the unending pressure, the clock never stops. You've got like, it is like, I I have trouble describing it and I'll share a story with you that I, I didn't write in the book and, and, and maybe I should have, but I'll share the sure. story with you. So you, when you, when you, uh, so in the process of all of my research, I, I've watched this event a hundred, a uh, hundred times. I've seen this just repeatedly and you can predict where it will start breaking guys. It's where the, you reach this loose sand and you watch this event and you see these guys just fall apart. And it, it is heartbreaking to watch because you literally see the look in guys' eyes, this look of desperation. They, they, they just like, you, you can't get escape this weight. It is unending. It is just absolutely soul crushing. And I would drive home from Camp McCall to my home in Fayetteville. And I would, I would have to pull over on the side of the road and sort of collect myself. Cause I just saw a bunch of dudes get wrecked under this apparatus <clears throat> and I have a son in the army and he started out his life as an infantryman and he obviously wanted to go become a green braid because all real men do. And he called me one day and, and he just, so and it's not uncommon for him to call me. So it was no big deal, but I happened to be pulled over on the side of the road after one of these emotionally significant events. I came a call and he said, Hey dad, I, I don't think I want to become a green beret. And I know you're going to be disappointed. And I, and I, I had, I felt this amazing sense of relief that like, <laughs> thank God my son doesn't have to go put himself through what I just saw those poor hapless candidates do those kids got absolutely destroyed and thank god i i have done well enough in my life that my son doesn't have to suffer the same uh, uh s- same indignities that i did and of course now he's a pilot living the best of the best life i mean you know I think we all agree that pilots have a significantly better quality of life uh, than your average ground pounder. And, and I, I, I'm so thankful. Like, I mean, like he's more successful than I could ever hope. And he never had to endure the indignities and the, and the pain and the, and just the, the, the despair of being under the Sandman. So I I try to describe that in the book and I I think I do it justice, but I'm only describing one event. You could have to do six teen events in a week. I, I, I can't fathom uh, how challenging that is. I was um, uh, on Friday. I was interviewing uh, Christopher Miller, uh, the former uh, secretary yeah. of defense, uh, who is a special forces officer. And he yep. specifically mentioned the Sandman as his gut check. He's like, that's the one I was in charge of yep. uh, at SFAS. And he's like, oh, my God, it was so brutal. <laughs> Yeah. It, it, and it's, and it's just relentless. Like you can, you can complain all you want. Uh, you can, you can, you can be as hard as you want. You can be strong as you want, as fast as you want. That Sandman doesn't get any lighter. The Like the, and the cadre, if, like if that thing is just pressing you into the ground and you're dragging it, the cadre are just going to like, you got to move it. Like, that's it. Like there is no, there is no relief when you're under that thing and, and it sticks in guys' minds. It, it certainly sticks in mine. Uh, I'm thankful that I never have to recertify to earn my beret because <laughs> if I had to get into the same man, I don't know if I could do it. It just, it just, it destroys guys. 
So, I mean, the you do provide some uh, guidance on uh, not tying, uh, which you're definitely going to need during team week. Um, and then at the towards the end of the book, there is some uh, specific guidance about, you know, the quote unquote older folks who are in their mid to late 30s versus some of the younger guys and, and how they should prepare differently. Yeah, we you know, we get sort of three unique populations of guys that go into selection. You get uh, the, the young guys, 18 x-rays coming in off the street and, and they, they skew young, although many of them have college degrees, they're a little bit more mature. You, you can't join uh, 18 x-ray unless you're at least 20 and you got to be 21 by the time you graduate. So so you got to be a little bit older. So that's one population. Those guys are physically a little more resilient. Obviously, you're young. You can run all day and all that. You still have to prep. And, and, I, and I spend some time talking about that. Um, all, all in that group is also the younger guys. You get a huge interest of high school kids that are like, I, I don't know what I don't know what Green Berets are or do really. Um, but it's something I want to be a part of. Like, how do I prepare for that? And it's like you got to sort of temper their enthusiasm a little bit. You're five or six years away from being even, even eligible to come, but there are some things you can do to prep for that. And, and the, that's the, that may be the biggest challenge. Cause as we described earlier, 77% of them aren't eligible because they're too fat, too dumb and, and too lawless. So I give some, you know, practical advice. Here's how you can prep. Uh, without actually like, you know, prepping. Um, but, you know, here's how you sort of align yourself with the values um, that that we look for in uh, in young special forces candidates. I like to say that, well, how do you make a good Green Beret? You make a good Green Beret from a good soldier. You make a good soldier from a good citizen. You make a good citizen from a good person. So this is how you can become a good person. And here's the things you can do. So I spent some time talking about that. Then you have the uh, the active duty population, which is a the the has the lowest selection rate of any of the groups mm. is the active duty guys. And it kind of makes sense if you're, are, um, you know, you have all of the, you have to prep for selection while balancing all of your day-to-day -day duties in your job. So kind of makes sense. So I, I spend some time talking about how you can do that balancing family life, uh, making that work for you. And then I spend some time talking about the, the, the older population, and you get, a, you actually get a quite a few of these guys. I, I get messages on social media literally every day from an older guy. He graduated college or he started a business. He went off and did a trade and he's, you know, in his late twenties, early thirties. And, you know, he's married, maybe has a couple kids and he's thinking, I feel like I missed out on something. It's almost like a, a, a midlife slash quarter life crisis. Hey, I, I'm, I've always felt the need to, to, to serve. And, and I, this green beret thing is just, it's, it's a mind, it's an ear bug. It's in my head. I, I, uh, how can I do this thing? So I spent some time giving that advice as well. And that's a unique population in that uh, many of these guys are very established in life. They've got businesses, they've got, um, just, you know, significant roles in their communities and they, you know, how do you suspend that life? to go take a year or two years to become a green beret and then go back to that life as, as likely as a, guard, a national guardsman. And that's no small task. And for, you know, for a lot of those guys, you kind of got to, you kind of got to be able to, to reality check on them and say, it, it's not, it's not possible. You can't, you can't have the best of both worlds. You can have the, you can have really good parts of both worlds, but you can't have full autonomy and keep your, your full thriving career and do this green beret thing because they are both endeavors of immense sacrifice. And eventually you're going to run out of things to sacrifice, likely your family, maybe your physical health, maybe your mental health, uh, who, who knows? So, so I, I try to be as realistic as I can in the book mm -hmm. in, in that I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. I'm not, I'm not a recruiter, so I don't have a quota. My goal is to get you prepared um, spiritually, mentally, physically, interpersonally. And in that, uh, preparation is a little bit of truth telling. And for some guys, they just need to hear, um, here, here are the sacrifices that you must make. You decide if you want to make those sacrifices, but here is what you, here is what they are. And, um, uh, and the response from those guys in particular has been very, very positive. Like that's what I needed to hear. Thank you. And, and bo both in, I'm not going to pursue this thing or I am definitely going to pursue it. Um, so th that's what I needed to hear. And, and that's been, that's actually been really, um, really affirming to hear those words from those guys saying, thanks. I needed that. And, and then from the young guys saying, uh, like now I know if I go, I've got a fair shot and, and, and now I know what to do to prep. So I've been really pleased with that, that part of the publishing. 
And you said the the response to the book so far has been really positive. Um, you know, I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit of like what the feedback has been like, and, and let us know where people can find uh, can find it. Ruck up or shut up. Yeah, the the, the feedback has been really really strong, uh, strongly positive. I've only had one bad review, and it was from a guy who didn't read the book. He he published his review the day I the day I put the book on the market. He clearly didn't buy the book, and it was, I don't know what I don't know what his problem is. So uh, take that for what it's worth. Every other review and every message that I've gotten, several hundred, has been overwhelmingly positive. I've had messages from. Parents of candidates, you know, a, a guys, you know, dad who's sending his son off to do this dangerous thing and just didn't know anything about it. Couldn't find any good information on it. You can go on, you can go on uh, social media and find any number of cool guy videos that will tell you nothing about what the reality of it is. And they read this book and say, now I know what to expect. I know how to support my, my, uh, my son or, or wife saying, I know how to support my husband in, in this endeavor. It's important to him. And therefore That's it's cool. important to me. Here's what I want to do. So that's cool. I also get it from young, uh, young kids saying, I, I just need some guidance. I, I, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm struck by how many young men don't have a, a good mentor to, to explain like basic things to them. And, and so I, I try to do a little bit of that in this book. I, I don't want to become everyone's father. Um, but uh, but but I like there's a, there's an opportunity here for me to influence how these guys see uh, this 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 thing of being a Green Beret, whether that is the the physical preparation of it or the culture that surrounds it. You know, taking responsibility for yourself, big boy rules, big boy consequences, um, you know, being being switched on, being competent uh, and why that's important. And, and and I try to do that in the context of this is why that's important for selection. But that's also important for like life, like not being a dirtbag. And so I, so I've had a ton of response from those kids that have been like, this is really, really helpful. And then of course the active duty guys saying, you know, fine, you know, the only thing I knew about the selection before was from three guys in my brigade that went and failed and they said they didn't make it because they had the wrong tattoos. And it's like, Oh my God, no, it's not why. I, and so, um, so the, the, the response has been really, really positive. And, and like I said, sales are double what I expected them to be. And I expect them to, 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 to continue on that. And, and I haven't advertised it. Like I, it's, I'm not like, you know, do big Instagram campaigns or Facebook ads. It's just sort of word of mouth. I figured that, that if word of mouth, uh, got the misinformation out there, then I can go word of mouth and get the, get the correct information out there. So you can, you can find the book uh, on Amazon, Ruck Up or Shut Up, A Comprehensive Guide to SFAS. Um, it's right there. If, if you're, if you want to check out the book, but you're not certain it's right for you, the first chapter I have in its entirety for free on my website, you can go to tfvoodoo.com. That's my website for my, my land nav uh, company that I run. Uh, and, and I have the first chapter there for free. So read that. That'll give you the vibe of what the books, what, what's in the book and, and what's in it for you and, and, and what it may mean for you. And, uh, and if you're interested, get the book and, uh, and read it. And, and, and I think you'll be, you know, no matter what the reason, if you just, a, a an SF history buff or, uh, you're into physical performance, uh, or you got a loved one that's going to selection or, or you're going to selection, get the book. It'll be immensely helpful. And, uh, and there's more on the way. I've already, I've had a ton of guys. Uh, reached out to me and said, I love the book, uh, but I want a specific workout program. One of the things that I didn't do in the book was give you a specific day by day workout program. I said, here are the things that you should be focusing on because uh, there are so many other programs out there and, and guys tend to be really territorial about them. Hey, I do tactical barbell. So I'm only going to do that. Or I only do calisthenics. So I'm going to do that. Or I'm a CrossFit guy. So I'm only going to do that. I don't want to do battle with that. Um, I want guys to make the, their own. I want them to be good critical thinkers. I want that. I want to teach them how to think, not what to think. So here are the things that they should be thinking about in fitness prep. But but there's a in that process, I've gotten hundreds of guys saying, "Hey, that's a great and all. I love all that, but just tell me what to do. T tell me how many pushups to do, and tell me how many weights to lift." And uh, so I said, "Okay, well, let me take the let me put my money where my mouth is, and I'll I'll take the principles that I outline in the book." and uh, and put them into a workout program. So I'm working with a, a team of strength certified strength and conditioning coaches and some physical therapists and some nutritionists um, and a whole whole slew of experts and we are developing the 
uh, the best, most comprehensive ruck-based selection program available. That's going to be in another book, and it'll be it'll be a fraction of the cost of any of the other programs. Again, I'm not throwing shade on the other programs. They they provide a valuable service. Some guys need a daily you know subscription service with a coach. Um, but uh, for those that don't, I'll have a second book out hopefully by the end of the summer. It's looking really promising right now, though. And for uh, people who are in the North Carolina area and are looking to get involved in some of the the uh, land nav stuff, um, can you tell people a little bit about what you're doing there? Yeah, we do. So we, we run a we call it the land nav muster, and uh, we run uh, we run a couple classes every month. Um, the dates are available on tfvoodoo.com. Uh, it'll give you an outline on what we teach and, and how we teach it and when those course dates are. Tickets are available there. And and what we do is it's you know land nav is unique. Uh, of course, we recognize that that it is a it is a growing uh, elephant in the room for selection. And and I, we talked about some of those issues. So that's really why I developed uh, developed the musters is to to address that. Said okay, um, I, there are there are some baseline skills and land nav as a skill is very basic, right? It's sort of you know distance and direction and then plot a route. And but in that plotting a route is sort of the art. And, um, and so we, we, we talk about that. We spend a, a significant amount of time talking about how to plan routes, what to look for. Here's the obstacles. Here's, here's how to avoid them. Here's why, you know, here's why you choose handrails and navigable terrain features and checkpoints and, and whatnot. So we spend some time doing that, but what the musters really become have become is sort of selection strategy. You know, here's how to think about these problem sets. Here is here is how to here is how you need to think about cadre, because, what you know, what's unique about selection is that in every other military training you do, you're given the task, the condition and the standard. And then you're assigned a non-commissioned officer who will teach, coach and mentor you to get you through that process and help you learn. And then you show up at selection and the cadre at selection do not teach coach and mentor they uh they assess that is their role and they are absolutely die hard about that so for a lot of candidates that's really disconcerting in that here's this senior non-commissioned officer a green beret he's going to teach coach and mentor me and that guy's just going to stare at you with a blank face and and say candidate do your best so so interacting with those cadre becomes critical because you're getting assessed and for a lot of guys they're not prepared for that. So we spend some time talking about that and why that's important and how you can prepare yourself for those interactions. And so the, the key is, is what we're teaching guys is through the venue of land navigation is how to be accurately assessed, how, you know, so selection strategies. And that's really what we talk about in the, in the, in the land nav musters. And it's a, a, we spend about nine hours doing that. And we do a terrain walk. So it's focused on land nav, but it's really about selection strategies. And the feedback from those guys has been, I, I literally have guys, every time a selection class graduates, I'll have a dozen guys email me and say, I got selected. And that specific thing that you taught at muster, I applied it like four times. And this other thing, like saved the day. And you told me to do do my my RV procedures and it saved me because I would have lost my map or, or whatever. And it happens every class. So the feedback from the land nav musters uh, has been uh, has been really strong as well, and uh, and so we're going to continue that, and we're we're going to start uh, offering a, a night land nav course again because we recognize guys don't get to do night land nav, and, and what we're actually finding is that only only about half of my students that go to the the musters are SF guys. Uh, or guys in the pipeline, I get about a quarter of them are civilians that have no affiliation with the military. And they're thinking about going to going in to join the army or, or to become an 18 X-ray. And they just want to sort of, you know, touch the magic a little bit. So they come out and, and we let them touch the magic and we, they, we let them talk to, to some magicians. And then about, a, about another quarter of guys are guys that are going to OCS or Ranger school or some other NCO um, education school. And they've got a land nav test there and there's nobody in their unit that can teach them land nav. Like there's literally not a single NCO in this soft skills MOS, uh, you know, sustained brigade that can teach them that. And so they're like, they're desperate. Hey, can you teach me? Yeah. Come on out. You're going to get a little bit of selection strategies while you're out here, but we're also going to teach you how to land nav. So it's a, it's, <laughs> excuse me. It's a, it's a pretty diverse, a uh, group student, a uh, group of students that come out, and uh, and the feedback is that this thing is valuable, and, and they want more. I've actually had guys that have come to, to come to the same class, and so I teach one class, 
I do it. Uh, I do it in two different venues. One one is uh, on Bragg, and one is out in the, the SFS Land Nav area. It's an open public um, public wildlands. You can go out there anytime you want. Um, and and I've had guys that have come to the same class three different times. The same guy pays to come to class three different times, and they say I, I would I would gladly come to five if I could make it out here that often. They absolutely love what we're what we're doing there, and and that's the that's the only feedback I need. So um, again, if you come to the muster, though, you're not going to get any secrets. We're not going to violate our non disclosure agreement. We're not going to tell you any of the standards. We're just going to teach you the skills. We're going to teach you the strategies, and we're going to teach you the things that you, you ha- still have to do. You still have to go to selection and perform. I, I could I could show you. Every single land nav point out at Camp McCall. I'm not going to, but I could. You'd still have to go put a rock on, right. <laughs> heavy rock, and then go find them with your blistered feet and your sore back, and it's raining, and God help you. So, um, so we're, we're, we are we're very careful that we're we're honoring the regiment, um, but we think that we're going to provide the regiment with uh, with some some really good candidates here. So I hope everyone will go and check out the book. It's called Rock Up or Shut Up. The Comprehensive Guide to Special Forces Assessment and Selection out on Amazon now. David, thanks so much for spending some time with us uh, today. And, um, you know, look forward to what you have coming out up next. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, since I get lots of questions, too, about uh, about this subject, I'm glad I have somewhere to direct all of these uh, young people to. Yeah, I appreciate you. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're doing we're, we're doing good things. The, the regiment is on the right track. Uh, w- w- it, we are vital to the na- to the national interest. We we owe it to the nation to we have a duty to the nation to tell our story, and uh, and I think that's what that what th- what this book does a little bit is it tells our story. So I appreciate what you do to tell a story. Now now I'm making a contribution as well. So thanks. There it is, folks, straight from the man himself. Always great to have David on the show to clear up the many, many misconceptions there are out there about special forces. I hope this offers some food for thought for people who are considering going to special forces assessment and selection, as well as for the public out there that takes an interest in these subjects. I'll pass on one final thought before letting you go, a great piece of advice I received way back in the day. That's to never self-assess yourself when you go to selection. Let the instructors do their job and assess you. A lot of people quit because they self-assess and build up a narrative in their minds that they're not doing well enough in the course or that they just aren't good enough to cut it for whatever reason. That sort of insecurity eats away at them to the point that candidates self-select themselves out of a course by quitting. Uh, So I think that dynamic exists in every special operations selection course, whether it's Rangers, Special Forces, Delta, SEALs, MARSOC, whoever it is. Just don't do it, folks. Do not self-assess. That's my my big parting advice here. Um, And I'm sure, you know, uh, Mr. Walton or Dr. Walton would agree with that. So until next time, I'm Jack Murphy, and this is Military Matters. Go to stripes.com, use promo code podcast and save 50% on your digital subscription. Go to stripes.com today. This episode was brought to you by Homes for Our Troops, a nonprofit helping build and donate homes to injured post 9-11 veterans. Visit hfotusa.org for more information.